Hello, everyone. I am so happy to have all of you here. This has been, so far, I'm looking at the numbers, a terrific turnout. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I, of course, am here with two wonderful authors. One of them we just had not too long ago, but we're happy to have back again. I'm we happy have... to be back. I'm happy to be back. <laughs> we're here with Ken Liu and Kate Elliott. Hello, you two. Hello. Hello. We have been chatting wonderfully in the background, but I am glad to hand them off to all of you so you can enjoy these wonderful minds. Uh, Ken Liu is an award-winning American author of speculative fiction. His works include The Grace of Kings, The Wall of Storms, The Veiled Throne, and collections of Paper Nagerie and Other Stories, and The Hidden Girl and Other Stories. In conversation, of course, we have Kate Elliott, who has been writing science fiction and fantasy for nearly 30 years. No, no, more than 30 years. I'm more sorry. than 30 years. We're over, we're over that line. Guess what? Over that mark. Over 30 years. <laughs> she is best known for her Crown of Stars epic fantasy series and the New York Times bestselling YA fantasy series Court of Fives. Today, we are here to discuss the paperback release for Ken's latest Speaking Bones, the fourth book in the Dandelion Dynasty series. I was told to put it sideways. <laughs> and then, Ken, is your arms ready? I, I'm ready. Uh, All right. So, so here is. Oh gosh! Please don't topple. Uh, so here <laughs> is the series as a whole. I don't know. They can't fit in the screen. Yeah, we can just throw. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably my favorite part is is these two were meant to be one book. You know. Oh my gosh. So we had to divide it in two, but yeah. there you go. Yeah. So wait, so lift up the other two again, Nick. Okay. Nick, I'm just telling you right now. So the, the important stack. thing to know. So so keeper six. Yeah. So so. It's important to know that Ken and I first met <laughs> when it, it many years ago, I don't know, time has no meaning anymore, but right. I told him he was working on Grace of Kings. You were either working on it or you were, maybe you weren't done with it. I was yet. revising it at that you, point, I think, yeah. You were revising it. And I told you I would give you a gold star if you went over 200,000 words. Because I like other people to suffer the way I have suffered of writing books that are way too long and you only get paid for one book. I just had this conversation with someone. They said, oh, I just finished my new book. It was 165,000. It's the longest I've ever written. And I said, you can go for 200. And he said, you only get paid for, you don't get paid for the extra words. And I'm like, I know. That's why I want it's other true. people to suffer with me. So <laughs> I'm really, I really love to see Keeper 6, which is like 55,000 words <laughs> up against these large books. People so must you, join you in the paint. So Ken, Ken, I'm so proud of you. Right. Yeah. I, I did get the gold trilogy. Star, so that was very cool. <laughs> For those who haven't ordered their books yet, you'll notice there's, uh, if you're watching live, a link below that'll take you to our website where you can not only order any of Ken's books, including new paperback release of Speaking Bones, but also Kate's book, The Keeper Six. Uh, the latest book, and we will have signed book plates for you while supplies last. So make sure you order those so we can get you logged in for those. And lastly, if you have any questions you would like to ask Ken, you'll notice there's another button below called Ask a Question. You can submit your questions there and they'll be answered later on the program. All right, I'm going to go ahead and disappear for now, but I'm going to leave it to Ken and Kate. Oh, so that's good. To take it away from here, I'll see everyone later. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Um, and I really want to encourage people to ask Ken questions because he already knows the questions I'm going to ask him, except for, uh -huh. this, except for this one. We're going to start with something he's not expecting. Okay. So, so a mutual acquaintance of ours who I will just say is Zen Cho. You should all like her latest novel is Blackwater Sister, a fabulous contemporary ghost fantasy story. It's funny and also profoundly deep about fantasy anyway. Anyway, she was in Malaysia to visit her family and an interviewer came to her and said, um, can I do an interview with you? And she said, sure, because that's what we do as writers. And then this interviewer sent her something called the Proust Questionnaire. Have you heard of the Proust Questionnaire? No. no what is so, that? So, Ken, so I'm, I'm reading off screen right now, but you can still see oh, me, dear. right? Can you see me? Well, yeah. so you're going to have, I can't see your face, but you're going to have the same expression I had when I saw this. It's up oh, on dear. Vanity Fair. This is the Proust questionnaire, has its origins in a parlor game popularized by Marcel Proust, all right? Okay. Who, wrote, who, who like us wrote very long novels. That's true. Here are That's some true. of the questions in the Proust questionnaire. What is your idea of perfect happiness? What is your greatest fear? What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? Like I'm gonna tell someone I've never met before that, right? 
what do you consider the most overrated virtue? What is your current state of mind? Um, anyway, it goes on like that. So, Ken, I just want you to know, I'm not going to subject you to the proof oh, questionnaire. Thank God. <laughs> because I just, I, I, anyway, do you have any it's commentary? Sort of like, on? Let us, let us produce as much discomfort as possible, stranger. <laughs> it's a very strange thing. It's, it's not even like, what is your favorite animal? Or right. what is your favorite color? So that you could, I right. don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it as a partner game. I, I, I get it. Um, but as a interview questionnaire to use with, you know, somebody you haven't met, that, that just doesn't quite make sense. But okay, I'm 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 sure Zen handled it with as much. I, yes, yes, we all like. we all we all suitably were horrified um by this. So I'm not so I'm just gonna do something very different. Actually, I'm gonna do exactly what I was gonna do anyway. Um <laughs> Because I want to talk about Epic. Yes. And you knew I wanted to talk about Epic because this is the fourth book of a massive, massive series. Um, and, you know, Epic fantasy is also used as a marketing term, as we know, and understandably because we live in a commercial world. And sometimes I'll pick up a book and start reading or I'll read a book that's been marketed as Epic fantasy, but it doesn't feel, feel Epic to me. It feels like it got this put on it, but that it's really, and the, I don't say that to criticize it, but just that I have particular ideas when I think about epic. And I wanted to know what is epic, epic fantasy to you? I mean, and, and in the sense of where did you start from when you began to conceive of and begin writing this series? I mean, I, I guess um, I, I... I don't know necessarily you'll agree with me, but because a lot of your books are actually very similar to the books I like to write in terms of their concerns, but it's possible that you come at them from a very different direction. So the way I think about it is um, epic fantasy has to be a big story about um, really the fate or the story of a people as opposed to the story of an individual. Um, I think that's what distinguishes an epic fantasy yeah. um, for me, because individuals in epics are stand-ins for abstractions, mm. uh, stories that the people tell themselves about who they are and what they stand for. Um, in, in some ways, I would say epic fantasy is a way to connect with some pre-modern storytelling traditions. I think one of the things about modernism, the term modernism um, in, in literature, is this intense focus on the individual, a sort of giving up of yeah. stories about national fates and, and grand epic sweeping tales of, of what does it mean to be American? What does it mean to be, you know, a people? Um, these these are the kind of stories that people now shy away from in in, in modern uh, literature. But epic fantasy seems to be one of those places where we can still tackle that. We can still go into it with um, no shame, and and because we've always loved to ask these questions about who we are and and what we stand for as a people. Um, so that's kind of how I feel about epic fantasy. They're they're tales about peoples, about civilizations, about big questions about you know who we are um as opposed to very intensely personal psychologically focused stories uh i mean i'm simplifying quite a bit but that's kind of how i feel well it is to me when i look at the difference between let's say lord of the rings which is a story about change and i mean it it something like lord of the rings is embedded in the entire history you can't separate it from that mm -hmm. Um, and if you compare that to someone like Hemingway, right, it's, it's very much about I'm this dude and I have these feelings and I'm working through them and or whatever. He, sorry, I, I don't like Hemingway, um, but I, he and I don't work on well together. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and, and that contrast to me and in that sense, Tolkien was almost it was working in an older tradition. Yeah. And, and he himself knew that he was working in an older tradition. So. I, it, I, I think this is a great way for you to describe what you did, because this is the story of uh, a culture 
and not just one culture, but in the end, two cultures and mm -hmm. how they are completely changed over this long, this long um, four book setting, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I notice about a book like this is it can't be done. People can say, oh, well, there was, there was, I, I'm not saying people say this about Dandelion Dynasty, but sometimes people say there was too much. This could have been done in half the length, but it couldn't have been done in half the length. It can only be done in this short length if, as you say, it's pulling away these larger stories, the, the story of the people and moving back down to the individual. So, and, and structurally, um, you work the way the way you expand the story of the people is with the first book we really only see one culture although it is a culture that's of several cultures that have in the past come together to form it so can you talk about the structure of the whole series and yeah. how you how much you knew in advance and how much you worked into that structure as you were writing yeah so um i think the best way to do that is to sort of explain to you how i conceived of the series and, and what I was trying to do in some way. Um, I was very intrigued by this aspect of modernity um, that that I noticed um, and I couldn't quite figure out how I felt about it. So uh, Americans or the United States um, from its founding has had a very interesting relationship to telling its own story. Americans love to tell our own story. We, we love to um, explain who we are to the world. We always sort of pictured ourselves as distinct in a, in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go back to the earliest stories that you know our founding um, members, founding generation, told itself about what America was, you notice that very quickly they settle on a particular storyline right after the American Revolution. Um, everybody seemed to suddenly settle on the idea that America was the Roman Republic reborn. Uh, so you have the Federalists writing actual, you know, yeah. papers to 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 explain you know why the constitution is awesome and and why um we we should vote for it under a roman name uh you know the federal papers are you know from publius um and the federal era in architecture and fashion all had this yeah. sort of idea of yearning towards the roman republic um and even today when you go to dc i mean you know these buildings yeah. are built years later but they look like Roman temples. Um, and we even have, you know, the Senate, we have, we have the Capitol. Um, in fact, when, when uh, a former president was facing a choice that Caesar also faced at one point, his followers urged him, uh, if you recall, to cross the Rubicon uh, to, to, to essentially destroy the constitution of the Republic. Um, it's, it's remarkable to me how much um, Rome plays in the American imagination, and, and so much so that we've now consciously and unconsciously started to tell our own story yeah. as an echo of Rome's. That's why there's so much concern about um, our fiscal policy, so much concern about our overseas empires, so much concern about what it is that whether the republic will last you know what is our fate as a republic um i i totally get it i i, I understand the analogy but to me it's also very strange um it makes america seem like some sort of greco roman punk nation that we are <laughs> nothing more than a translation of roman analogs that we just have to constantly explain ourselves by reference to that particular aspect of antiquity, but it's just one. And when you have that one story as the dominant epic story that you model yourself after, you start to have blind spots. You know, we, we end up being very, I, I would say, I would argue that um, as a result of our obsession with Rome, we tend to have a lot of blind spots about the power of bureaucracies and the nature of bureaucracies and the and the ways in which bureaucracies can become its own uh democratic as well as anti-democratic 
uh, institution. So anyway, all that is to say, because I was very obsessed with this and I was trained as a lawyer, I was very interested in constitutions and constitutive ideas. I wanted to write an epic about the emergence of a modern nation very similar to uh, America, perhaps, uh, in fact, a alternative version of America. But instead of using Rome as the historical analog, the, the, the story on which the story is told, I wanted to use Han Dynasty China as an example, as the historical analog to explore how do you create a America-like modern nation, modern culture, multicultural, multi-ethnic society with a constitution that is very focused on um, the idea of renewing itself, of, of, of being something brand new that's never been done before. But instead of saying we're an echo of Rome, what if we are an echo of classical Han Dynasty China as the sort of free analog? And if that's the case, what would this alternative America slash Dara look like? That was the impetus behind the whole project. So instead of exploring yeah. America as Greco-Roman punk, that's where the silk punk comes from. I And so you always knew from the beginning that you were going to have the invasion and that was going to rend or uh, the fabric, right? And then it would have to be, as you say, reconstituted. Because yeah. I, I'm really fascinated. I haven't actually heard you talk this specifically about this specific aspect before. And it fascinates me because having read the whole thing now, I can totally, I now I, I, it makes everything make sense. It made sense to me before, but now I understand this underpinning. And I'm fascinated because having gotten to the end and knowing what the end is, I can see, you know, you can't begin this book. You can't begin Grace of Kings and know you're going to end up there because kind of the standard epic fantasy thing, fantasy thing to do is to end up with some kind of a, circular restoration of stability. That's right. Or if there is change, the change doesn't include modernity. Yes. And one of, uh, oh man, I have so many questions. I have even more questions now than I even had already. Um, it, it, but, it, it, but this, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just, I just, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense if, if you keep that in mind and you read it. It sort of makes a lot more sense why certain choices are made. So, for example, right, Absolutely. America as a nation, we are sort of in perpetual revolution, right? One of the amazing things about America is after the American Revolution, we kept on talking about how we're going to have perpetual revolutions. Um, I think that's an aspect of America that American authors have always tapped into, the idea yeah. of a perpetual yeah. revolution, and that we always have yes. to renew our commitment to constitutions, that we are, we are, as a nation, not conservative. I mean, I think that's something that people have to always keep in mind. As a nation, our impulses have always been revolutionary. We have never been a conservative nation. Um, uh, we may argue about just how much revolution we want, but we're going to be on constant revolution mode. Um, and that's what Dara is. That's, that's in some ways the mode of modernity, this idea of constantly reconstituting ourselves every generation, taking the old stories, which are the stories that unify us, but reinterpret them every generation. That's why throughout the series, you know, I, I'll just lift the stack again, right? Throughout the series, one of the things that keeps on happening is older stories are brought back and reinterpreted over and over again in the same way that we keep on reinterpreting our foundational myth, our founding fathers and the founding generation's struggles and their their ideals and their hypocrisies. We keep on bringing them back and reinterpreting them in the same way that the people of Dara do. Um, it's, it's okay, Ken. Kind of so I have a question. I have a question. So in book one, one of the things you do there is, which is true to um, ancient China, which in the modern day, one tends to see China as more monolithic. But of course, 2000, 2,500 years ago, mm -hmm. it wasn't. It was made up of many, as you know far better than I do, made up of, if you know this history a lot better than I do, you made up of many nations uh, who had, you know, where, but, and one of the things you do with Dara is you show that and show how they were brought together under this one umbrella. But it occurs to me now, as you say this, 
that that's one of the necessary ingredients for the story that you're telling across, especially then into books three and four, because book two is the cataclysm and books three and four are the reconstitutiveness of the story, but mm -hmm. also that impulse to find ways to, to knit things together in a new way, but also that impulse to, um, what's the word? I mean, you see it in the technology, to change, to move with change and to create new methods of doing things. It, it, because it's there all through, you see it, it begins in the first book because it's already embedded in the culture. Can you, yeah. I'm, I'm really, yeah. That, that, that's why it's, 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 it's much more, um, so, you know, authors are never supposed to tell readers how to read their books. Um, but I think there are readings that are much more interesting than other readings. So reading this book is about That's a good way to China and, and mythical China is just yeah. not very interesting. But reading this as yeah. using East Asian legendary history as a way to reflect on America's founding and America's progress as a constituted state. That to me is much more interesting because that's what I was trying to do. Um, so the idea of constituting a new national identity out of these very disparate local identities, that's the problem that, you know, the, the colonies becoming the United States, that's something that they had to sort of face and figure out. What does this mean? Like, what, what does it mean to be a nation? What does it mean to have a constitution? What does it mean to have all of these ideas about how things ought to be? Um, it, to tell that story in the context of Rome is one thing, but to tell that story in the context of using this fantasy historical um, Han Dynasty analog as the foundation is something else entirely. And I think it just makes it so much more interesting to reflect on things that we normally don't think about in our modernity, right? We don't think a lot about bureaucracy, but bureaucracies are incredibly important. And that is why bureaucracies and their, um, the bureaucrats role as both a source of stability and a source of change is explored with such depth in there. And in, in some ways that's even more relevant to today because we now living in an administrative state with our bureaucracy serving a far more um, important function as a branch of government. I mean, I would say bureaucracies are in some ways almost completely independent of the judiciary and the legislative and the executive, and they should be studied as its own thing. And we don't pay enough attention to the bureaucracy as a thing um, in the United States um, as part of our modern um, life. Uh, but in Dara, you know, bureaucracy is foremost center. It's, it's something that people are always very concerned about and it becomes actually an instrument uh, for creating revolutions, um, as, as you probably can see. Yeah, you. one of the things you do consistently is these, again, this, this sense of change. Um, and I wanted to talk, well, eventually we have to start talking about personal lives, because that is what, I mean, obviously that's what we embed with as the reader, right? We grab yeah. a hold of characters who we care about and who we can either, you know, that we feel some connection to. Um, and you and I can go on this theoretical thing for like five we, years, we can. Right, we can, <laughs> and, 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 we, and we will um, to some extent. But I, I wanna just talk a little bit about, or I would like you to talk a little bit about change. Yeah, you, who, who do you want me to talk about? Well, no, well, I don't want to talk about people yet. Let me just do one more theory question. Um, because one of the things that I love, there's, you know, there's so many things I love about this series and, and that I think it's just done so spectacularly well and so unusual in terms of the field. But you show change on so many different levels and in so many, along so many different vectors. So it's not just change of government. It's, there's change in the technology, which is examined very closely. There's change in language, there's change in poetic forms and how the forms of the, you know, in the islands, how do, how are we gonna deal with our old island tradition and these Dara traditions and how do the two can we, you know, are we going to go back to our old forms and reject them? Are we going to find a way to put them together because we actually love them too? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then when, 
there's just, and by the end, so many people have, the, the, those things work together in a way that becomes so seamless that by the end, you can't imagine him, imagine the story without them happening. So can you talk about change? And, and it, in this series in specifically, but also how you see the, the role of change in writing big stories. I, I, I feel like, you know, change is um, the essence of, of what it means to be uh, a, a, a modern person, for lack of a better term. I mean, modernity is about change. It's about constantly reinventing and reinterpreting and reusing what's come before uh, to do something maybe it was never meant to do. Um, I mean, I'm generally skeptical of arguments about how we are very different from people in the past because I, I don't think human nature actually changes as much as the specific manifestations of human nature. But I do think there's some truth to the idea that the pace of change is accelerating and, and has been accelerating for the last few generations so that one of the essential experiences of modernity is that the concrete wisdom we gain from uh, our parents or even from our older selves become inapplicable very quickly. Uh, and we have to sort of figure out what are what is the essential unchangeable part of that kind of wisdom and what part is just superficial. Um, change uh becomes the part of uh how i conceive of 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 dara and how i wrote it um i think you know when you're writing something like um epic fantasy but really any kind of literature i i get a little frustrated by this idea that the author is supposed to put a specific message into the story that readers are supposed to then discern i just don't think that ever works because that's not what writers do, right? When you're creating a story, you're really creating a world that reflects in some sense your understanding of how the world functions. When I'm creating Dara, I'm obviously putting into it all my thoughts about what constitutionalism means. What does it mean to have a working constitution? How does it, what I think of as America's enduring story and what I think of as America's um, blind spots and, and what are America's strength as well as our own weaknesses. Um, I put all of those things into Dara um, and there's no message. There's, there's nothing, I can't reduce it down to yeah. um, something. Yeah. So, you know, go back to your earlier point. If I knew, if I could have written a shorter book, I would have done that. The reason the book is as long as it is is because I couldn't. No, it has to be, I, having read it, it has to be that long. I don't see how it could be anything else and do what it did. You could take the same material and write a different book in one volume. Right. I don't, you know, right. it could be done, right? But it wouldn't be the same book. It would be the same book. Yeah. Um, so I put that in there because, you know, this 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 process of change, this this idea of this messiness, this um, yes. yes constant reinterpretation of what's come before. This is the experience of modernity. Modernity is about reading through this palimpsest of layers of history, of, of, of re-examining everything. Oh, I have this wonderful quote. So uh, Jack London, who is not one of my favorite writers, he wrote this um, incredibly <laughs> racist fantasy uh, called uh, uh, The Unparalleled Invasion. Um, but in there, there's a beautiful moment where Jack London says, you know, the Anglo, the Western mind or the, 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 the English speaking mind um, thrills to short Saxon words. Um, and whereas, you know, the Chinese mind is incapable of understanding uh, these, these beautiful words, which to me is extremely comical because um, modern English is replete with non-Saxon yeah. words. When you're yeah. talking about anything modern, economics, chemistry, physics, politics, Sorry. none of the words I just said are yeah. actual Saxon words. That's yeah. why it's particularly comical because it, it seems like, you know, Jack London was either on purpose or or, or <laughs> unconsciously not real, realizing to what extent a Greco-Roman punk language that we now speak 
not at all a Saxon language anymore. Um, and that to me is the essence of modernity. We're, we're using secondhand words to express original concepts. We are now, when we say physics and chemistry, we mean completely different things than what the roots meant to the Greeks. Yeah. But we are using their word. We're using secondhand words and expressing completely new ideas. That's the essence of the punk aesthetic. That's why I call this book Silk Punk. It's the whole point. We're reusing old things to do entirely new, to serve entirely new purposes, to repurpose them, to tell a new story, something brand new um, that is nonetheless rooted in this very complicated layers of history all the way down. Change. It's, it's all about Well, change. you know, it's the messiness that makes it long, right? That needs the detail. Because if you want to line up your, your plot and your characters and your ideas about what you're saying about them and make everything pat, make all the edges smooth and be very be very firm about well this is how it is and this is how it isn't then it's then you can do everything much in a much shorter field you can everything can feel kind of you know like well it's we, we have this is the bad guy and that's the good guy and we know because what color hats they're wearing but it's the <laughs> instant the instant you introduce messiness which is the truth of the world yeah, you have to. It gets more complicated. Someone once said, I can't remember which one of my books it was. They they said, well, I mean, there was a lot I liked about this, but ultimately I'm not going to read any more of her books because <laughs> she makes me that her 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 world is too uncomfortable and messy. And I thought, well, good. Right. And yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a fair thing to say. I don't want to read this. I want my world tidy and clear and not to make me uncomfortable but the world isn't like that right there's and nothing also, about the world that is the, like the, that the way that you and i understand the world we are not capable of writing books like that it's just it's not that it won't feel true to our souls to, i've tried have, yeah <laughs> and i can't yeah i can get like yeah. 500 words in and then all of a sudden right right yeah it, it's just it just doesn't work that way yeah I want to ask a question that is um, based, that is related to what we've been talking about. Uh, El El Eliane or Eliane? I'm sorry if I don't, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. I've only just finished book one, but I wanted to ask in general how you reconcile borrowing from Chinese history. Um, I love the strong parallels while also departing from it in fiction. Um, probably the same way the founding fathers did. I mean, we yeah. see ourselves as Rome, but obviously we wrote a different constitution than the Roman one. Um, that's the long and the short of it. I don't. There's nothing to reconcile. That's what we do in real life. We we um, try to tell our story using past stories as a shorthand for things that we want. Um, actually, I mean, the question is actually. I mean, I'm 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 I'm, I'm going to try to answer this question in two ways. The The simpler way is um, I don't need to reconcile anything because I'm doing the exact same thing the Founding Fathers did by retelling America's story using yeah. Rome yeah. as a historical analog. So I'm doing this by retelling America's story using Han Dynasty China as a historical precursor. Um, the longer and more complicated answer would be that um, the idea that you can you have something called history that you have to depart from or follow it. It's a very modern idea, and that's not all that um, useful, really, uh, in my view, um, because it sort of conceives of history as something static and that can be owned by somebody and that uh, is relevant only for a certain group of people. It's sort of like if X history can only be used by X writers who must use it accurately um to to say exactly what we expect them to say um which i think is just a a, a very strange idea um I, if you don't think it's weird for america to sort of conceive itself as a second rome then i don't really see anything particularly weird about retelling america's emergence and the story of the modernity using um, a han dynasty legend uh, as, a, as a as a starting point um and in so far as what I want to borrow from history and what I want to tell new, um, 
almost everything is a borrowing and everything is also new uh, because I just think that's the way modernity is constructed. We are telling new stories using uh, secondhand words and secondhand concepts. Uh, all of modernity is about taking past ideas and reusing them until it becomes something entirely new that can be used by the next generation to do yet more innovation and change. Um, and then hopefully throughout the book, you can sort of see that happening, that older pieces are constantly being reused and reassembled yeah. into yes. new things, yeah. um, which is, you know, part of the fun. You know, it's interesting because we've been talking a lot about modernity and how this book is in conversation with um, modernity, but also with the mythology that nations and cultures create about themselves. But it's interesting to me because one of the criticisms often directed at fantasy, especially any fantasy that has a kind of uh, authoritarian or monarchy or imperial rule is that fantasy is at root conservative. Right. Which but, so yeah, so to me, to me that in itself comes from, that statement comes from a position where people are making assumptions, um, but that which, which they themselves have brought. It, and so they're like fixed in this idea, as you said, history as a commodity that has told you how you want to think about things. But I don't think there's any reason for fantasy to be any more conservative than, yeah, any, other, than any other genre. Yeah, I don't really see fantasy as particularly conservative in that sense at all. Uh, I mean, certainly uh, a lot of the fantasy that I've read is very much not about that. I mean, uh, the 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 Dandan Dynasty is particularly um, uh, self conscious about this. You know, it's it's trying to tell a story about a monarchy, but it's very much about how this is a monarchy that is. Um, in the process of dismantling itself uh and and the entire series points towards the idea of the emergent constitutive constitution a constitutive set of acts that will ultimately bring about the downfall of the very thing that tells the story but that you know in some ways i feel is the um is also the experience of our revolutionary modernity the idea that we're constantly trying to tell these temporary stories that make sense of everything that's around us, all the changes, knowing that these are structures that will have to be dismantled with the next generation. These are temporary. They serve the purpose for now, um, but they are going to point towards the next step um, in, in, in what's going to come. Um, we construct the, the seeds, you know, we plant the seeds of our own destruction. Um, that is what revolutionaries do. Um, and uh, we should be grateful that the revolution never stops. Yeah. I I want to talk a little bit about how you, well, about the core of how most readers will read a book like this, which is the characters. And I believe there are not many characters who appear in the first book who also are still alive at the end of the second, because you're covering, I don't know, is it a hundred years, 80 years? It's over a hundred years if you go all the way from the beginning, yeah. It's over. Yeah. Years. And one of the, oh, there's so, I have so many things I could say. So many things, so many times. Well, a couple of times in this book where I could all of a sudden realize what you were going to do. And I was so mad. I was so <laughs> mad. Like, um, which of course is the, the result we all want as writers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, so, well, let me start with 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 one thing, which is that you knew you had would have to introduce new characters as you went because you end up with grandchildren and great grandchildren playing mm -hmm. a role of the mm -hmm. characters we see in the beginning. Um, do you? I don't even know where I'm going with this question because I love all the characters except for the ones who I hate. But then I hate them in a way that means that I love them as characters, right? It, that that's an important way that we. That, that we, uh, I feel emotional about people. We want to feel emotional about readers, but did you, did you, do you think there's a special issue, a special challenge with having to bring up new characters when people may have gotten attached to an original group? 
I think so. Um, there's there's a particular challenge in that I have to sort of show throughout the series how entire narrative frameworks are changing. So by which I mean the following, right? So we can imagine uh, this is this is not in the grace of kings itself, but it's it's an analogy. We can imagine a set of ideas, an ideology, for lack of a better term, that would portray somebody like Achilles as actually a great hero, right? Like his wrath, his 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 utter uncompromising nature, his his obsession with personal honor. We can imagine a set of ideas and beliefs and ideologies that would say this makes Achilles into a hero. We can also imagine that thousands of years later, looking back on him as moderns, we would judge him to be not a hero at all. And in fact, he's a terrible person. Um, yet, how can, can you do that in the same series? Can you have one yeah. book in which the the dominant ideology is such that this guy is a hero only to have the next book the next generation come in to reinterpret that person as not a hero at all and yet another one more book later yet another generation would have to come and say these are the things that we accept about that person these are the things we don't and we now have new ideas and new beliefs um and now we have to sort of see and reinterpret everything they did in this new light. That can be difficult because readers will grow attached and become absorbed in the ideology of the first book, only to be told by the second book and the third book that they have to sort of abandon it, that all of that stuff was in some ways not really true in light of later information, later beliefs. Um, so that is hard, uh, but I was sort of helped in this process because I had some very good historical analogs to follow. Um, so one of my favorite writers, Milton, did something very similar. So if you remember reading Paradise Lost in book one, yeah. Satan and his fallen angels were classical heroes, right? Satan was smart, brave, he was courageous, he's rallying his, his yeah. troops and saying, we have not failed we will rally and we will defeat god and and the way you know that entire chapter is written um they sound like achilles they sound like aeneas they sound like the great classical heroes you really identify with them i mean you know satan really comes across as this great wonderful hero so brave so daring so handsome um and then yeah, that's know, that's always important too right? Always important, right very important very important and then you get to the to the next book and, and 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 the next book you start to realize holy moly i i couldn't believe i was seduced by satan i really thought he was a great hero and now now that you know the angels have 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 explained how to how to see him i really do see the error of my ways um and so you know milton was able to do that with his readers to, to first seduce them with these terrible characters only to reinterpret them um so you know that kind of thing is in some ways what was happening in the series um you could see that there were certain things that the founding generation did that were not in line with their own ideas that were actually terrible things um but um, you know, it's not until the later books that you get this sort of revisionism, reinterpretation, re-understanding of what they did. Um, and I, I think, you know, uh, I tried to do the best I could to pull that off. But I think it is a risky thing to, to have readers liking yeah. a set of characters only to have new characters supplant them and sort of show in some ways that they were actually not really as great heroes as, as you might have thought at first. Yes, but at the same time that many of the things they did were necessary, sometimes sure. even the bad things, yes. for what happened next to be able to occur. And that's yes. again that messiness. Messiness, exactly. That's the messiness that we we can't we can't just judge. Um, base we can't say there's this good. The essentialism. There's no essentialism there. This is essentially good and essentially evil. There are some things that we can judge in that way, but mostly culturally and in the historical process, it's much 
more complicated. It, it, it is. And it's, it's, it's the complexity and the messiness of real life. I mean, you know, when we go back and read history, right, there are lots of people who yeah. are great explorers, great generals, great leaders. Um, but, you know, if you just apply a slightly different lens, they are not so great. Not and and so great. we should not be so celebrating yeah. them at all. Um, but then I, I think the lesson isn't all history is bunk. I think the lesson really is we need to be very humble about our own stance of moral superiority. You know, future generations yes. will not judge us. Um, yeah. We yeah. we are trying to do the best we can, uh, but knowing what we know now about the past, it is certain that we have lots of blind spots and lots of assumptions that we're making that is going to in light of the future appear to be terrible. Um, and future generations will have to judge us um, the same way. There are things we did that could be justified as the best we could have done and necessity. And there are things we are doing now that will not be judged that way, yeah. um, that will be seen uh, as terrible. Um, and we live with that. You know, we, we, don't, we don't have the benefit of, of hindsight. We don't have the benefit of, of the luxury of you know, perfect knowledge. Uh, we don't, we can't position ourselves from that future position. We just have to do the best we can um, in this moment. Uh, and accepting our own messiness is, you know, part of what it is to be human too. That's right. Bryce asks, is there any character in the series who has a point of view close to your own personal views? I'm not sure there is one. I, I suppose uh, you could argue that, you know, as a, as a lawyer and as a constitutional, um, uh, uh, a student of constitutions, uh, perhaps the, the view that's closest to my own is Farah, the, the youngest daughter of yeah. Kuni yeah. Uh, at the very end. I love her. Yeah, her, I love her, her view of we must always have doubt is perhaps the closest to my own view in terms of that. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I can't say that I, there are not aspects of Kuni that I, I don't identify with or aspects of Gin that I identify with. I would say that um, perhaps like all authors, all characters are in some way, yeah. you know, some aspect yeah. of themselves that they, they can empathize with. I, yeah, I often feel like the, the flat characters are the ones that don't really have much of me in them. I but as for the rest of them, however terrible or wonderful they are, there's part of me that informs them. And that's because what can, gives them life, right? Exactly. How can you write humans without putting your own, without filtering them through your own understanding of human you're, nature? You're, I mean, just you have to do it that way. That's also what makes each novel unique, each writer's body of work unique, because it is filtered through them. Yeah. And without that, it would just all be AI generated buzzwords, right? And but with it, it means you can take the same story and have 10 people or 100 people tell the same basic story, but it will still be different. Even if it's right. a fairly familiar story, that lens will that filter makes it I mean, different. That's why it's so it's so frustrating in some ways to the way we, we talk about books, right? Like, you know, one of my least favorite um activities as an author is to write the plot summary that you know marketing oh, yeah. sometimes demands that yeah. you do and i'm like the plot summary is the most useless thing in the world because again if i could have written my story <laughs> as a plot summary i would have done so and gotten um, paid the same right exactly. the <laughs> plot is, is is the least important part of a book i've never really liked a book because you know, the plot summary ends up being the thing that I cared about. It's just, it's just not. And yet we seem to have no other way of describing books than by giving a plot summary. It's it's a really weird thing. Um, if there were a way for us to describe books to each other without resorting to plot summaries, I, I suppose we would be doing that. But I I don't know. I, I feel like plot, sum, plot summaries are deeply unsatisfying. And, and I not... think they're part of the capitalistic commodity system, right? Did did people back in the day, did when people were talking about the Shanama when it was being written and spoken aloud, um, a retail, did people give plot summaries? I don't think so. I think it was just understood that it was this set of tales and today you were going to get the feast, right? right? Or whatever, that, that episode. Um, all right, I'm gonna, okay, we're running out of time. So I wanna get through these 
three questions. I like how you're like cracking your knuckles. You're like, let us get, let's let get us get cracking on these there. questions. <laughs> Amy, Amy loved, Amy loved the Dandelion Dynasty series so much. Can you tell us anything about what's next? And then um, the second part of the question, sorry, I'm going to put two in. Also, I think I saw that you're a producer on the Three Body Problem TV series. Can you tell us anything about that? Like, when will it air? We won't tell. Okay, so two things. Number one, uh, what's coming next? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm working on a bunch of short fiction uh, projects that I'm having a lot of fun with. Uh, so Kate knows <laughs> it's, uh, um, it's very different writing um, a story of, you know, 5,000 words. Uh, after having written again, you know, after yeah. having written yeah. this thing, I was I was telling Kate I'm that- I'm left higher, higher. You can't see the whole thing. <laughs> Is that 200,000 words, Ken? How many gold um, stars? How many gold stars now? A few, I think, a few. Yeah. Uh, after writing that, you know, five thousand words is barely enough to introduce one character. You know, how do you how do you tell a whole story? It's, it's impossible. Uh, but it is it is fun to sort of get back into that mindset and write short stories. I actually wrote one. Um, I mean, I I don't know how you did what you did in Servant Mage. I mean, you were able to tell an epic fantasy in a novella. Um, that I, I I collapsed it with Servant Mage and also with Keeper Six. I kept the cast small, but I also there was only one single problem I was solving, and everything else had to just go. Go oh, right. It's 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 still messy, but not messy in the way your big epics are. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, Furious Heaven, which is the sequel to Unconquerable Sun which is the space opera based on, it's the gender swapped Alexander the Great in space. So the first one was long, right? It was 160,000 words and Furious Heaven is massive. Like I was trying to, I was chasing you, Ken. I didn't quite, it's not as oh, long gosh. as Speaking oh, Bones. Um, uh, so I don't know, it's like a yeah. demerit for me. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> but I don't even know. I And it's fast paced and it's crammed with incident and action and stuff. And I like, I looked at it at the end and I said, I cut everything I could from it. I didn't know how to, it, yeah. It's not a 50,000 word novel. Nobody can, can see the stuff that you cut out. But I mean, I, I, I love the way that you still implied the so much, you know, the, the, all the rest of it, the messiness that's not in the, in the story yeah. itself. Yeah. It's implied. Um, so anyway, so, you're working uh, on a 5,000 word story. I'm working on five thousand stories, and 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 a couple of them actually, uh, and and they are very exciting, and I, I'm actually very excited about um, where they're going and and how they're going to come out. There's one that I just wrote uh, that I'm still uh, trying to find a market for it, um, so I hope I find a good market for it. It's very, it's it's a it's a story that I love a lot, um, but it's a little quirky. So who knows uh, whether I'll eventually find a good market for it. Uh, so keep your fingers crossed for me um, on the TV show. Uh, so here's what I can say. Um, the title producer is thrown around Hollywood. It's sort of like you worked on the show in some capacity. Um, so it can mean people who have done a lot and can also mean people who have done literally nothing. Um, so that should tell you something about um, the range of involvement people may have with it. So I'm not even allowed to say what range of involvement I'm, I have with it, um, uh, other than to say that um, it is not my natural inclination to mess with someone else's stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So take from that what you will. Um, and given that, uh, you can imply the state of my knowledge. Um, and so I can say nothing, uh, but hopefully I've said enough to tell you some things. <laughs> you have, you have. Ken, uh, so Davis asks, you mentioned working on an annotated translation of the Tao Te Ching. Can mm -hmm. you talk about a few interesting or relevant topics in the text? Also, will it be released in the coming years? It should be coming out soon. Uh, so basically during the uh pandemic when things were incredibly tough um uh, i turned to reading the Tao Te Ching, which is this two to three thousand year old classic 
um, text that brought me a lot of comfort. Um, and I ended up finding a lot of really interesting, um, you know, how you always think you know a classic, even if you haven't read it, and then you go read it and it's nothing like what you thought. Um, you know, if you haven't read Moby Dick, you probably have all these ideas about what the book's actually like, and then you go read it and you realize that it's nothing like what you've been led to believe it's like. Um, I think all of us have had that experience. I'm sure, you know, um, one of the things about living as a modern person, again, is we never encounter these classics without the layers of expectation built up around mm -hmm. them, right? Mm -hmm. So when you, I'm sure by the time all of us read Romeo and Juliet, the plot is not a surprise to any of us, right? By the time we actually got to read the play, we all knew what was going to happen. Um, but nonetheless, I will say that um, despite all the Bugs Bunny interpretations and so on, um, I was <laughs> utterly amazed <laughs> by, by the yeah. book itself. The, the, the play itself is nothing like what I was led to believe like you know the wherefore art thou you know when you actually read the line you're like oh that is not what it meant that oh it's not it's not the you know here from the balcony and look for where he is it's it's not that at all um so the Dao Jin was like that for me i had known snippets of it and i even you know i've 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 read quotes from it i've i've read jokes based on interpretations of it tons of commentary on it so i thought i knew what it's about um, but once again, when you actually read it, it's nothing like what you thought it was about. It's, you know, I, I really encourage all of us to read the classics that we haven't read um, for real, not just from yeah. quotes yeah. and interpretations, because it's yeah. it's just not, it's not like that. Um, I was amazed. And one of the most amazing things I took out of it is um, Lao Tzu turns out to have a huge, huge, deep-seated skepticism about language um, entirely. He, his argument seems to be that um, language is fundamentally useless. Um, we can, if I may make an analogy, uh, I've, I've given this analogy to Kate before, but the rest of you haven't heard this before. Um, the most interesting things about reality are like dragons. You know, you, you sort of go into the woods and you see this dragon flying overhead. It's it's like this moment when you see some aspect of reality and really understand it. Here's the thing, though. Dragons are incapable of being painted or described. You just can't. You can try. You'll never be able to actually capture the essence of a dragon using words or paint or whatever. In the same way that you can never capture these aspects of reality using words, using paint, using interpretive dance or what have you. It's just, we are not capable of representing some aspects of experience using these symbols, these signifiers. We just can't. I've been saying forever that much of our lives and modernity is about using secondhand words to tell original ideas. That can only succeed up to a certain point. Beyond a certain point, words cannot go. It's just reality. It's experience. It's the lived life. Um, and Lao Tzu was very much about that. He, he says, you know, we have to sort of accept that words are just not capable of going certain places. Um, and that was not a thing that I really understood until I read the whole book and really pondered it and really thought about it. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, so in terms of aspects of the Dao De Jing that I thought was pretty interesting, that was one of them. Um, I ended up also writing um, a, a bunch of little interpretive essays, if you will. Um, they're really essays in the original sense, meaning they are attempts to paint the dragon, to describe the dragon, to yeah. capture the whole, that aspect of reality made in my heart. They're not arguments. They're not uh, well-structured, uh, persuasive, you know, attempts. They are, they're, they're really, um, they're not, they're not pieces of rhetoric designed to lead you to a certain place. They are literally essays in the sense of merely wandering about, trying this, trying that, trying to figure out what it is that I felt. 
um, then I put those in the book too. Um, and they're, they're, they're windows, Ken. They're windows, right? They're little, they're, they allow us little glimpses, which is really what most writing is, little glimpses into who we are or what we think about something. Yeah, and, and it is coming out. Uh, 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 I have I can't announce the uh, the actual publication plans yet, uh, but there is an audio version coming out of Audible. Um, hopefully later this year, um, I think. So that should be a lot of fun. Okay, we're gonna go a little over because we have questions, and I want to try to quickly get through them all. Um, Davis has asked two more, and I'll get back to you, Davis. But I want to get to the other two people first. Igor asks, what do you recommend for kids who want to start reading Star Wars novels in addition to your book? Um, oh, good Lord. Um, there's oh, a lot. Uh, there's a there's lot a, out there now. I, I got to tell you, uh, Star Wars these days is unbelievable. Um, one of the amazing things that Disney has done since taking over is to ask um, contemporary writers from other genres who are fans of the universe to come in and, and write their own interpretation of the universe. And so, um, you know, Kate and I, you and I both know tons of people who have written in the Star Wars universe um, and because yeah. they're fans. Um, I, I don't have a specific recognition because if I were to give you the recognition, it would just basically be the whole shelf. Um, all the new Star Wars books are amazing they are they are so inventive so wonderful they take the universe in directions that you never could have imagined i i personally could never have imagined i mean to see denny hosick older uh version of of star wars oh god it's it's just you can't i i i can't narrow down my recommendations to one or two books uh but all the new star wars books are just incredible yeah. they do so much with expanding the universe with making everybody feel like this is a grand grand universe and everybody has a place in it it's it's wonderful i i agree i just want to quickly say i don't know how old your child is but there's middle grade there is young adult and then there are the regular adult novels but anything published in the last like 10 years maybe 10 12 years i don't know that it's just it's just try just try whatever, and if one book doesn't work for you, try the next one. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so I, much. There's so much now. There, and if you want to start with the middle grade or the young adult, that may have may have less, um, I don't know, violence and sex in it. If that is important yeah. for it, yeah. But I just I think you can't really go wrong these days. It's actually mm -hmm. amazing. It's really okay, good. Julian. What kind of books do you like to read? What are some of your favorites? Um, so I love reading nonfiction. I think it's really important as a fiction writer to actually keep on reading a lot of nonfiction because otherwise, um, I just think like reading outside of your core genre is a really good way to keep yourself connected with the freshness, the 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 the, the aspect of yeah. discovery that that writing entails. Um, so one book that I've been raving about lately is Lulu Miller's book. Uh, why fish don't exist. Um, it's a difficult book to describe. Uh, Nonfiction books are often hard to describe, but this one particular. So it's, it is a history of science. It's also a biography, an autobiography, uh, um, uh, uh, um, an, an actual uh, science book. It's, it's all of those things wrapped up in one. Uh, but it's, again, just this wonderful book about what it means to be a modern person, to seek meaning in the universe. Um, and uh, I, I loved it. I thought it was wonderful. Um, in terms of fiction, I swear this is not planned, but my my older daughter and I are reading Court of Fives now uh, by Kate Elliott, and then we love it. It is incredible. It's, um, I, I suppose, I, I, I don't want to give you a plot summary. So imagine American Ninja Warriors, but um, with bigger stakes and cooler. <laughs> <laughs> Something you like know that. what my pitch line for that is? It's American is Ninja Warrior line? meets Little Women oh. in a fantasy Egypt uh, during the time of Cleopatra, except not oh Cleopatra, Ptolemy Egypt. Yeah, that's it. Oh that's exactly God. what it yeah, is. That's, that's good. That's good. I got but the Esther, Little Women. Esther is a gymnast. And so yeah. to me, one of the things I wanted to write about, sorry, uh, that I have to say this, because this is important to me about this series, is that I wanted to show girls being competitive and not being ashamed of it. 
um, something that I don't think we see enough of and competitive in this case, athletically. Yes, that's what absolutely. That is, absolutely. I mean, it's a lot about a lot about a lot more than that, but that is the core of it. The main character I, I, I mean, is an athlete that. and she's competitive. I'll tell us your pitch. I think we're all both going to be so happy because we kept on saying, wait, there are little women references here. Does that make sense? That's, we're like, that, that is awesome. It, it, I, that was just a, like a structural thing I threw in. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Whatever. All right. So I'm going to, so David has two more questions. So sorry, David, I'm only going to ask one of them um, because we are running long. Because it's Ken and I. And of course, instead of a trilogy. If we could have done we would have done so. so anyway. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but this is quite an interesting and a very philosophical question to end with. Can you talk about your thoughts about this is almost a Proustian question now that oh, I think wow. about it. Yes. So we're almost coming full circle back to the beginning. Can you talk about your thoughts of how human nature doesn't change? Does that mean only young children? <laughs> I think it's a great question, though. Does that mean question. only young children can substantially change their nature for the better? For example, could adult, um, I'm going to just say this because those of you who haven't read the whole series, you've got a long ways to go. And I don't think of this particularly as a spoiler. Could the adult Timu have grown out of his shell? Could ta Tavanaki have realized like there are the value of walking on a different path than what their fathers would have wanted or did their childhoods limit their potential? What a meaty question. What a meaty question. Okay. So you have, you have one minute. I have one minute. Okay. So number one, when I say I don't think human nature changes, I don't mean that in terms of one person's um, inability to change mm. their beliefs or yeah. their, their ideals. I, I think people, individuals are actually entirely capable of change in many ways, often surprising. There are aspects of the individual that I think is sort of, for lack of a better term, molded into their soul and then they cannot change. I, I cannot imagine, for example, um, you know, my grandmother, other than as being just this very kind, loving person, there's something about her nature from birth that's like that. And I, I don't think she could have changed any number of things about herself, but she couldn't have changed that. So there are aspects of ourselves I think are sort of we're yeah. born with, and we try to figure out for the rest of our lives what to do with it. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're capable of changing our beliefs. Our, I mean, good Lord, I mean, okay, you and I, I'm surely we believe certain things at one point we no longer do. And, and if we're yeah. capable of change, yeah. that would be a horrifying thought. The, when I said human nature doesn't really change, what I mean is I think the ancients are no more wise and no less wise than we are and they're no more capable of compassion or no less capable of compassion than we are and i don't believe that the genghis khan's armies who slaughtered uh, millions were any less cruel or more cruel than modern humans are capable of being it is the circumstances in which they find themselves that lead them to do the things they do um it's not some essential you know, thing that 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 made ancient humans any more wise, less or more violent or less than than we are. Um, this is both a note of hope and also a note of caution. We we shouldn't think that we are incapable of descending to the same kind of atrocities that they committed. Nor should we think that somehow we are um, just infinitely wiser than they were and we would never do make the same kind of mistakes they did um we are in some ways luckier than they were being born in the times that we do and in other aspects less so um but human nature is is as messy as it ever was um uh, that's what i meant that is a great place for writers for a pair of writers i think to finish up um, human nature is as messy as it ever was. Same, same it as ever was in the words of David Brin, who I. I thought you were going to go with the song there for a moment. Same I as could, it ever I was. could dance it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Yeah. Ken, Kate, thank you too. This has been such a, a very philosophical and explorative uh, discussion. I love it. I love how these events just can go anywhere sometimes. They go yeah. any direction. Thank yeah. you. Thank you both. Thank awesome. you. And thank you to Mysterious Galaxy for hosting 
Of yeah. course. Absolutely. It's a real yeah. pleasure, friends. And don't forget, everyone, you still have an opportunity to order uh, either Ken's or Kate's books, any one of them. We have and I will again. do book plates. Yes, and book plates. And book plates, yeah. Uh, reminder, you know, buying the books not only supports uh, authors like Ken and Kate, but also supports the store so we can continuing, uh, continue doing wonderful events like this. Keep the doors open, right? Pay my mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> do oh, all that. Uh, everything, yeah. Human nature is the same. Wait, what do I eat? Do I have a roof over my head? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great Thank evening, you. day, whatever, if you're watching this in the future. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.